Thank you all for, for being here. Thanks to uh, Meshes uh, and of course also we'd like to uh, express our very special gratitude again to FACE for agreeing to do this conversation. And please give her a very warm welcome. I wanted to express my gratitude to Dorian Bergen, who was instrumental in making today's talk uh, happen. And of course, uh, Michelle Wallace, who is here. Um, the amazing Michelle Wallace, the daughter of Faith Wrinkle, the amazing author and writer whose texts are a daily inspiration. We should give a very warm welcome to Michelle. And we are also so excited that Jana Peel is here, the amazing CEO of the Serpentine. A very warm welcome to Jana Peel. And this is an exciting moment because it's actually uh, somehow in the lead up to this exhibition, which is going to start in a few weeks in London, the first survey of Faces work in, uh, in London. Uh, as we've been looking forward to this exhibition for such a long time. And mm -hmm. I wanted to somehow today talk about the uh, amazing trajectory of, uh, of FACE, and uh, there's so much one could discuss, but I sort of thought it would be interesting to be begin with the beginning mm -hmm. and kind of ask you how you came to art, how, how it all began, how you came to art or how art came to you? Okay, I think art came to me. Uh, it is very normal and natural for little children to love art. And so as a child, I picked up creating art. And uh, as a result, uh, I always had my crayons and my paints and my papers, and I always had time for it. So if you give a kid the materials and the opportunity and the time to do it, they will. Uh, and I got that opportunity at home. My mother was a fashion designer, so she, she, she loved art as well. Uh, and I had the opportunity. I also had asthma as a child. So I, uh, and so consequently, I, I, my doctors didn't want me to go to school on a regular basis because they were afraid that I would catch what? All those different diseases little children have? And so uh, my mother would go and get my uh, books from uh, Barnes and Noble. And she would uh, get my homework. And I, n I never went to school on a, on a regular basis until the second grade. And so I had my art to do at home. And I just. I had a wonderful life, sort of. <laughs> I, could, I could have a lot of fun, um, and I did. And the art was part of, part of my life, yes, and it continued to be so. And then I, I got to be an art teacher, which means that I found out about the little children in the art, because I started teaching them. Well, they were fantastic. Um, it, was not, it was not something that I understood, oh, well, I'm going to go up and be an, art, an artist. No, I didn't say that. I just said I'm going to do art, I'm doing art. Not be, but do. There's a difference, huh? And then later on, it occurred to me, ah, be, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's been very difficult, though. But it's also so fascinating that at the very beginning of your trajectory, it's not only that you know your mother was a, a fashion designer, but also you were surrounded by amazing artists. You met Jacob Lawrence, Duke Ellington, mm -hmm. lived around the corner. Can you tell us a little bit about these early influences and who, who were the artists who, who inspired you? Yeah, see, maybe that's the reason why I didn't take it uh, as a serious uh, venture, oh, I'm going to be an artist. Because there were so many artists living around me, right? And we'd see them all, all over the place. Jake, Romare, Bearden. Um, 
uh, even Elizabeth Catlett would come in from Mexico and she would make herself available. So artists were part of our neighborhood, yeah, in Harlem. Um, I am so fortunate about that because they didn't, they were not um, rare people. And they didn't like a lot of excitement over their fame. You know, you couldn't run up to them and say, oh, oh, I love your work. No. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so uh, it, it was kind of like a natural thing. I found out later it's not. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm so glad that uh, I, I had the, what, the strength to stay in it because it is hard. It's difficult. You have to uh, continue. You have to maintain yourself. And there aren't, uh, although I had a lot of really wonderful people who encouraged me and who made it possible for me to, to, to move ahead, you know. Uh, one of them is right here with me. Dorian <laughs> uh, Bergen from ACA Gallery. Uh, I, I just, I don't know what, what you could do as an artist if you don't have people who encourage you and open doors to you and show you the way. You really, you absolutely, it's the, it's the field that you absolutely need that for. I don't think you can make it without. And uh, fortunately for me, I've, I've had that. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. Now, one thing which is also interesting, it's, uh, and it's very exciting you know, this, to do this talk here at, at the Freeze Art Fair, because there are works here of so many different generations. And I mean, Panofsky once said that uh, the future is invented with fragments of the, of the past. And very often, artists are inspired by previous generations of artists. And the other day, we were at Bloomberg Philanthropies with our chairman, yeah. Mike Bloomberg, right. uh, and you. And I uh, had a conversation there, you know, in preparation of the show at the, uh, at the Serpentine. And you talked about Picasso, because we were asking you about the amazing series, The American People, from 63 to 67, which is going to be really a central part of the London show at the Serpentine. And you were saying that Picasso's Guernica was a really important influence. Can, mm -hmm. can you tell us about that? Yes, it was. We used to go to uh, the Museum of Modern Art. Guernica had its own room there, and I would take my daughters on a regular basis to the Museum of Modern Art to see the art. Uh, we didn't have a ton of museums in New York at that time. It was interesting, huh? But. Um, the Museum of Modern Art was my favorite, and I would take them there, and one of the principal things that we would look at, we'd go into that room where Guernica was. And uh, then when it finally um, went back to Spain after Franco died, Franco died um, I got invited to go there by the United States Information Agency. That was a real joy. And um, it never came back. Guernica went and left, and that was it. Uh, but we used to go every, every weekend, just about, to, uh, to the Museum of Modern Art later on, the Whitney and some others, to see the art. It was, it was just part of our entertainment. Did I answer your question? Yeah, totally. And I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking because it actually is very moving to hear that because it's so moving because today, you know, in, in 2019, you have all these new generations of people who go to MoMA to, to see your painting. Oh, yeah. And uh, that is an amazing thing, if you think in terms of history. Now, what is interesting is that um, uh, you were telling me about the riots, right? And in summer 64, there were many riots. And 
you could sort of see them in the street, you experienced them, oh. but they weren't shown in TV. They weren't shown oh. so much in the newspaper. So you decided to show them. Can you tell us yeah. about that? I, um, I couldn't understand how you could be standing in the middle of a, a riot and nothing reported about it in the papers or on television when you got home. And I, I just thought that was very strange. And then when I saw Guernica, uh, it occurred to me that uh, somebody is keeping the information back. And uh, I, uh, I, I love that work uh, because it, it seems so real. Um, and, I, and, I'm, and then here I am in the middle of the reality of a, a riot right in my own hometown in, in New York, in Harlem. In, oh my goodness, I, I think I want to do a painting about that. And I got the opportunity uh, when I had my first, I think it was my first show. My first um, solo exhibition in New York at the Spectrum Gallery. Um, the, 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 the dealer there was wonderful. Not as wonderful as Dorian, but <laughs> he was wonderful. Now it's interesting also. And he, he, he gave me this show. He said, what will hold an artist back is being somewhere where they can't wait, make art in the manner in which they aspire. And I wanted to make big works, but I was living in an apartment, and I, it was, the rooms weren't big enough for me to do that. So he said, look, I'm going to give you the key to the gallery. And when the gallery closes this summer, most galleries closed in the summertime in the 60s. And uh, we're going to be going up to, where was that place they all went? Yeah, Martha's Vineyard, Hamptons, and so on. And uh, I'm going to give you the key to the gallery. Can you imagine? Wow. And you go ahead and uh, paint, and paint big, because everybody painted big. But I was painting little because I didn't have the space. Uh, oh, they were painting all abstractions. But it doesn't matter. The important thing is I wanted to get my work bigger, and he wanted it too because I was going to have this show. And he wanted to include that in, in the work. Uh, so he gave me the keys to the gallery. And I went on a regular basis and created my painting, Die, which was the biggest painting I had done at the time. I've done bigger since. But yeah, that was, I remember a woman came up uh, came to the gallery when the show opened. And uh, as you open the door from the elevator, the first thing you saw was die. And there was all these people running, fighting, and carrying on. Like, it was, it was almost a natural thing in New York at that time, in the 60s. Not reported on, but happening. And uh, when she saw that, she said, ah, and jumped back on the elevator and went downstairs. <laughs> oh my God, I said. But what, what was more, uh, is very exciting about dye is, um, is the blood. It's very hard painting blood. It's hard to paint it. It's hard to look at it. It, it, it comes off as real. Huh? If you've ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. Painting blood is, whew, it's a lot. And I guess that was what that woman felt. She saw that blood. And there's people running and little kids and everybody. And she got out of there. She never came back either, by the way. Maybe later. <laughs> but <laughs> it now, was. Blood, 
was also actually, it's interesting because we met for the first time about two years ago in Dorian's uh, gallery where I interviewed you and it's really during that conversation that this idea came up, how urgent it is to you know, do an exhibition of yours in, in, in London and we sat there in the office of the gallery and basically kept looking at the bleeding flag. Uh, I will never forget that, it's incredibly powerful work, one of your bleeding flags. And these oh, bleeding yeah. flags play a big role also in the, in the London show. And it was also fascinating actually how we met because so many young artists urged me to meet you. And that's always been really? you know, in an interesting way my methodology because when I was a teenager around 85, I went to see um, the German artist Rosemary Trockel. And 85 was just a moment when Louis Bourgeois started to be well known, finally. Oh. And um, you know, Rosemary said it's very upsetting because there are so many more extraordinary pioneering women artists who should be visible. And you know, we should go from city to city and ask the artists, you know, who are pioneering artists we should revisit. And uh, she said, you know, I'm an artist, I can't do that. But that's a nice thing for you to do as a curator. I give you the idea. But anyway, I've done it ever since. And you know, coming to New York, I kept asking artists. And so many artists said, I should meet you, which is how this first Thank meeting you. came about. And we sat in the office for two hours, very intense conversation, looking at the bleeding flag. So I wanted to ask you, because you talked so beautifully about the difficulty you pain blood, to tell us a little bit about this series of the, of the of the bleeding flag, which is very much about what was going on at the time mm -hmm. in, in America. Yeah, well, when you're painting blood, you know, it, it becomes very personal that if it's bleeding, it's been damaged and death is maybe prominent or coming, something of the sort. It becomes real. Blood is. It's not anymore just red paint. It's, it's real. And uh, I just, I did it on a couple of paintings after that. I, I painted a lot of blood. It's, anyway. <laughs> and what about the flags? How did it start with the flags? Well, How did you came to paint flags? Well, there was this uh, feeling in those days that you should not condemn America flag in any way for anything. And um, the flag was, a, was like a private object. And uh, if you did express any feelings about what is going on in America, then you should be jailed or punished. And little children who were painting flags on their uh, dungarees or making some kind of statement about what was going on at the time, and there were a lot of very negative things going on in the, what, 60s, 70s, 80s, 80s. Um, and the children were taking part in it, and they were they were getting jailed, and they were getting yeah, they were being put in jail. And uh, so the uh, ACLU uh, and and a lot of other organizations to, to protect our right to free speech got involved, and the artists did too, and we had the show. Um, called Fl Flag, the flag, the, the People's Flag Show, the People's Flag Show, at the at the uh, at the Judson Memorial Church in in 1970 in New York, and uh, the idea was is to get all the artists, to get the artists to come together, and uh, create uh, a work of art that would express our protection of our freedom of speech in America. And um, I have this at the Judson Memorial Church. John and Jean Hendricks, who were uh, involved with me in this, were, um, they put it together with me. 
And we invited artists from all over, and everybody participated. It was fabulous until these people arrived who uh, wanted to stop the show and arrest us. And um, I had taken my daughter with me, Michelle, who was uh, how old? 18. You were 18 at the time. And um, they, they came to the door. I was all ready to go because we had, we had had the show. Lots of people had come. It went off very well. Uh, artists from all over had given us wonderful works of art. It was time for clothes. Let's go. And um, we had been told that we were going to be arrested, but uh, it hadn't happened. And I was uh, on my way out the door. But my daughter, Michelle, was still upstairs um, greeting people. And there were two people who had just arrived. Three people who had just arrived. And they did look a little peculiar. You know, they didn't look like most of the people who were coming to see the show. They looked, I don't know. Anyway, I'm downstairs. I'm ready to go. My daughter is upstairs. A friend of mine comes running downstairs and says, Faith, you better get out of here. She said, there, these people are arresting everybody, and uh, your daughter is one of them. I'll never forget why she thought I was going to leave with my daughter being arrested. I, I, I can't understand. She, she was panic-stricken. So I said, I'm not going anywhere. Are you kidding? So I, I went upstairs. And I, I thought, hmm, first of all, I, I don't know what happened here. I'm going to pretend I don't know what's happening. And I said, uh, uh, come on, Michelle, let's go. We got to go. And so Michelle said, I can't go. And I said, you can't go? What do you mean you can't go? <laughs> I'm under arrest. You what? <laughs> you, come on, let's get out of here. This is the Judson Memorial Church. We arrested. So one of the, uh, the, the uh, um, plain clothes men huh, came up to me and said, uh, we're the police, and your daughter is under arrest for putting together this show. I said, she didn't put together anything. She's only uh, 18 years old. She doesn't have anything to do with this show. So they said, they, and, they, and they kept looking at me like, well, uh, what then? <laughs> I said, I did. They said, well, you're under arrest. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know, I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> and my daughter home. Okay, so now I knew that was illegal because when a policeman is a policeman and they want to arrest somebody they, and they're asking them questions that might incriminate them, they have to admit that they are a legal entity and that if you, you know, I'm going to ask you some questions and, you know, you might get arrested depending on what you answer. Well, they didn't do that. So their arrest was illegal, that I knew. But they didn't care. I don't understand why they didn't care that the arrest was illegal. I don't get that part. That's the way they are. Huh? That's the way they are. Oh, is that it? <laughs> anyway, uh, they, they, were, they came to arrest three people, John Hendricks, Jean Tosh, and Faith Ringo. They came to arrest us. And I guess they had to do it. And I think maybe it was to scare us, just to stop having these kinds of exhibitions or whatever. I'm not sure. But anyway, the important thing is they took us. They put us in the, in the wagon, not wagon. Um, they had a car for the woman, me, and a car for the two guys, right? I gave Michelle my... Uh, pocketbook and, you know, all my money and stuff, because I'm going to jail now. So 
I better give her my keys. And so she, she was, you were kind of broken hearted that you weren't going to jail, right? No, I was broken hearted that you were going to jail. Oh, you were broken hearted that I was going. It was, it was strange. I never you never thought about that part? Yeah. Well, you might have thought it would be exciting. Did you think that? I didn't want them to arrest you. Oh, OK. Well, I didn't either, because, <laughs> you know, well, in those days, you know, the 60s, the 70s. Uh, I didn't want them to arrest you because it, I didn't know that they would separate us, which is what they did. Oh. They traded us. They traded me for you. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing was illegal. Actually, you don't trade uh, criminals, you know what I mean? Strange. But the main thing was to scare us into not doing any art that condemned anything that the America was doing, I think. But one of the fascinating things about being an artist is you, you have freedom of speech. Without freedom of speech, there is no art. You just forget about it. And we were determined that we would have our freedom of speech and we would create the kind of art that we thought uh, was commemorable to the United States and to our flag and our, our people. Which we is, were of course, why, do you, it. why you then painted Marflax. <laughs> painted what? You painted more flags. Yes, more yes. Flags. More flags. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. more flags. More Absolutely. Flags. You can't. And they're going to be a central part of, of the Serpentine show. So it's also another amazing series called the Black Light Series. And you told us, um, actually, in a previous conversation, that the Black Light Series came as a result of black power. Can you tell us about these very important series and what prompted it? Because it's another very important chapter in the, in the London show. Uh, the, the, the flags, black power, when black power was said by Stokely, by Stokely Carmichael in what, the 70s? Was it the 60s? What is it? 66. In 66. I mean, we said, what? 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 Black power? What is that? Well, we started yelling it all over town. <laughs> It wasn't important that, they, that uh, black people were only 9% of the population. 10%. 10%. That, yeah, well, what's the difference in 9 and 10? Not, that, not much. <laughs> but I just thought, oh my god, this guy is nuts. He's going to say black power, and we're only 10% of the population? That is wild, but I like it. <laughs> And uh, I started using it in my paintings, yes. Uh, United States, uh, I did several Black Power uh, paintings. U.S. postage stamps to commemorate the advent of Black Power. U.S. postage commemorate the advent of Black Power. It's an important piece yeah, he, in the show, yeah. Yeah, by arresting me, they inspired me uh -huh. to do more, mm -hmm. you know, because I knew it was illegal. And... Uh, I knew that they had to let us out. But anyway, when we got to the prison, I sent Michelle home. When we got to the prison. They sent a car for me and a car for him. No, no brutality or anything. They didn't try to beat me up or do anything bad. But they put me in the car with the woman. And John and Jean went in the car with the men. We got to the tombs. We got to the tombs, was it the tombs? I think so. Anyway, yeah, when we got there, the guy on the, on the door, he said, you, you, you're here to, um, to go before the, the court. And uh, if you get okay, you can, uh, what, go home and come back, or if you pay your, you was some kind of thing you had to do, pardon me? I needed to appear in night court, right, okay, or something. Um, I, you know, I didn't know what was going on because I was like, wow, wait till my mother hears about this. <laughs> oh, this is good. Say nothing of my husband, how about that? 
How am I going to explain this to them? Oh, it's awful. John and Jean were very, you know, they were part of the civil rights movement. What are you talking about, Faith? This is wonderful. But the guy on the door, he said, I can't let you in because it's too late. It's too late. You arrived too late. And, and, and the court is closed to any new people. I said, we've got 12 lawyers waiting for us. What, what do you mean? We, he said, I'm sorry, I cannot let you in. I said, what kind of craziness is this? <laughs> so John and Jean were talking to him. And they got him to say that he would turn his back and we could sneak in. I said, I've never heard of anything like that. <laughs> you ever heard of anybody sneaking in prison? No. <laughs> Oh, it's crazy. So they said, Faith, come on, please. We're almost there. We're almost there. Come on, the lawyers are waiting on us. We have to get in here to get out of here. Other than that, we're going to have to spend the night in jail. Come on. They're not going to let us go. So what are you going to do? <laughs> I guess I'm going to sneak in jail. I never heard of that. <laughs> but I guess I'll just have to do it. So I sneaked in jail. That was something. Yeah. And we got up there. The lawyers were there. It was a very interesting experience that so many people had come to support us. And that it went, it went over rather well. They let us out. And, and you know, we went home. And you were exonerated. And of course, we were exonerated. And all of the money that people had sent us from all over the country, uh, we didn't need it because we, there was no case, because we hadn't really committed anything illegal by giving this flag show. What does that mean? You know, we have freedom of speech. We can do it. And that idea of we can do it mm -hmm. is, is really such an important line, you know, because in a way, he also said, we can fly, you know, we, yeah. can, we can do it. And it leads to, because we're looking here at some of the quilts, and of course, they're going to play a very important role in the Servant Dunn exhibition. And that's a whole other chapter of your work we haven't touched upon yet. And there again, it has a lot to do with this idea of yours that we can just do it. Because you wrote, as you told me, an autobiography. We flew over the bridge. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, somebody tried to sort of prevent you from doing it, the publisher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you didn't let that happen, yeah. and you just did it. Can you tell us a little bit about the autobiography and how it was actually initially meant, you're talking about flying, uh, what was initially meant to be an autobiography as a book triggered these extraordinary quilts, which have become yeah. such an incredible body of work yeah. you've done ever since. Yes. Well, no one can stop you from creating your art and putting words on it. Uh, but they can not publish your book. Um, of course, you could publish it yourself. But they can also not publish it because they don't like it or don't want it or whatever. And uh, this uh, person, publisher that I had, thought she knew my story. I thought that was unreal that a person could look at you and think they know your story based on the color of your skin or the sex or, oh my goodness, that's crazy. But anyway, she thought she knew. And, um, but when I showed up with my story, she said, no, this, this is not your story. Uh, oh, uh, what? This is not your story. So she had already decided, based on being black and a woman, that I had a story different from the one I had. And I don't think there's anything more upsetting. I don't think there's anything been in my life more upsetting than that woman's statement about how she knew what my story was. Um, 
I, she made it so determined for me to get my autobiography published based on that statement. But it took me, I think it took me 15 years. Am I right? I, uh, it took me 15 years. And, and what, what uh, really helped me a lot was writing directly on my art. Yeah. So as you can see here, when you turn yeah. back, you can see there are many, many words on the yeah. clear. So you basically wrote your book. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I wrote, I wrote everything I wanted to say in my art. Uh, and no problem. Well, after you know, we got arrested for that flag thing, it, the news got around. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> and uh, nobody else tried to do anything like that to us. But um, art is not something that uh, one should be told what to do, how to make it, what to tell the world about who you are and why you are who you are. You know, we, we need to have our freedom of expression in our work. And I knew that I could write what I wanted on my art, even though I had a difficult time publishing my autobiography. I did get it published 15 years later by Random House. Yeah. And then, um, what? Little Brown, yeah. Yeah, and it's reached and, far beyond the art world. It's yeah, reached yeah. so many people, which yeah. is wonderful. And that idea, you know, because for us at the Serpentine, it's very important that what we do, that exhibitions are for everyone. And, you know, this year marks also the 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. You know, Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet mm -hmm. in 1989, in March. It was the celebration of the 30th anniversary. And he's very concerned because he says net neutrality is lost and we start to have an internet which is fast for people who can pay, and an internet which is slow for people who can't pay, which is against the idea of you know, the World Wide Web from the beginning. And we believe the same is true for museums. Uh, this is, we, we believe that exhibitions should be for everyone, which is why we have more than a million visitors a year, uh, basically with free admission. And we are, of course, so grateful to matchesfashion.com for enabling us to have free admission in your exhibition, uh, which will happen this summer um, at, um, at the Serpentine. And this idea of you know, reaching out to many, many more people who usually might not come to see an exhibition okay. is, of course, very important by it being for everyone. And your work does this particularly strongly through your many exhibitions, but also through your children book. Millions of children grew up with your books. And it's a great story how actually your quilts at a certain moment through Tar Beach, which hang in a doctor's office, yeah. as a poster, became these amazing children books. Can you tell us about that aspect of your work? Because I think the yeah. children book are a very important aspect yes. of your practice. Yes, I never thought about making children's books. Yeah. Uh, before I got this invitation from uh, Random House to create uh, Tar Beach, uh, Andrea Cascotti had been in her doctor's office and, and she saw this this uh, quilt poster, a, a poster that had been made from uh, a quilt of mine, Tar Beach, which is hanging on the wall in the back, is it not? Tar Beach 2. Huh? Oh, that's Tar Beach 2. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the, the very first Tar Beach that I did um, was made into a, a poster so that it could circulate more because everybody wanted it. And, um, she called me up and she said, Faith, this would make a great children's book. She said, would you be interested? And I said, a what? A children's book. Now, at City College at that time, that's where I went to school, they did not believe in teaching us in the art department about illustrations. Can you imagine? You know, there's, there's sometimes these uh, art departments that have want to decide what is art and what is not. And um, they didn't think illustration, book illustrations, was art. Well, I, you know, I'm not into that. So when she called and asked me 
would you be interested in making a children's book out of this story that I had told you I started writing on my work because I couldn't get my, my, um, my autobiography published? Uh, I said, hmm, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, but yeah, I, I could do it. I, I think I could do it. So she said, well, do it. And that, that became, uh, Tar Beach became my first children's book. And I am so glad that she called me. I'm so glad that I did it. And I've done 23 children's books to date. And uh, it's, it's one of the things that I really like to do. It got my, my autobiography published, and it gave me my freedom of speech completely. I love this idea, you know, that the freedom of speech is really what is the recurrent uh, theme of today's speech. And it's a wonderful continuation of the talk we had at Bloomberg Philanthropies yes. a few months ago. And uh, so grateful for today's conversation. I thought I wanted to end on, on two last points. One is uh, what you're working on at the moment. Uh, can you tell us about uh, what's happening in your studio in, in 2019? What are you yes. currently doing? Well, I am, I'm, I'm working on a series called Aging, a ling, a ling. <laughs> and uh, I want to show how <coughs> aging is changing, will change, will continue to change. Um, a ling a ling, aging, yes. I'm very, um, well, I'm right in the middle of it. I'm 80, 80. 80. <laughs> 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 oh, my goodness. 88. 88. Well, you know, sometimes it's a little difficult to remember. <laughs> 88. And 89 is coming up. Yeah, October 8th. But I think that, uh, I think we will change it. In another 10, 20 years, we're going to be changing the look. A jing -a ling is going to be changed, different. And we're going to be part of it. And, and uh, well... You know, I want to be in good health, though. I don't want to be here, you know, trying to struggle along. Because you got to keep yourself together, right? What do you know about it? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. And I have a last question. I see several young artists here. And I was thinking, you know, giving your incredible wisdom and experience, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote, the poet wrote this wonderful little book. It's like one of my favorite books is the advice to a young poet. Yes. And I was wondering what in 2019 would be your advice to, to a young artist? Do the work. Do it. And keep doing it. Maybe they'll like it, but you have to love it. And when you love your work, you are going to persist in it because the rest of us will come along. At some point, it will happen. You must continue to work. It's very important. We need to look. We need your, your look, your, what you see, what you want us to see. And it will be unique because it is only coming from you very important that you continue to work. That's so beautiful, Faith. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> <laughs>